Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Kara tonight. And we're talking about selling everything to Joseph. Under what circumstances would we sell everything to Joseph? This is based on a biblical story back in Genesis 47. And during the famine that people were going through back then, bit by bit, they ended up selling absolutely everything to Joseph. And so I want to look at that story. If you want to join me in that journey, let's open with a prayer. Shall we, good friends? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the one God of heaven and earth, the divine and the divine human. You are the Word made flesh. We pray for your presence among us tonight, Lord. Open up the pages of your Word so that we can see the thoughts and the feelings that you would share with us and that you would wish us to share with others. Amen. Such a blessing to be with you, sending love to all of those who are out there online and on the phone from Canada, getting the audio and here in the room. Uh, on this chilly night in the Northeast, selling everything to Joseph. Just some Bible stories. This is part of how I do this Bible study is that when I'm going through doing reading, there are certain things that just grab me. And we did a whole series on Joseph in the Bible study a couple of years ago, whenever that was. Uh, and I had totally forgotten this detail of people selling everything to Joseph. I just, I just forgot that part. I knew all about the grain and the seven years of plenty and so on, but I forgot this part. So let's read it. It doesn't take very long. It's back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible there, chapter 47. And I really want to analyze this pretty closely and talk about it if we can tonight. Genesis 47. So to set the stage, what's been going on is that... Uh, Joseph was sold into slavery, and he was in prison for a number of years, and then Pharaoh found out that he could interpret dreams, so he got out of his prison, and he wisely told Pharaoh not only that there were going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, but he advised him on what to do about that, which is to store up grain during the years of plenty, and then when there was famine, they would have grain to go around. And so Pharaoh thought, well, you're obviously the wisest person I've ever seen, so why don't you run the country and take us through this difficult time period? And so what's happened so far is that people have come from all different countries to Egypt. Joseph's in Egypt, second in command, and people come to him to buy this grain. And let's pick up at 47 verse 13 in Genesis here. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Yes, as Joseph had foreseen and when he predicted what the dream was about, uh, there was this terrible, terrible famine after these seven years of plenty. And look at verse 14. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Okay, so this makes sense. Joseph has grain. Nobody else has grain. So they travel down to Egypt or they travel across Egypt to buy grain and they're giving money in exchange for this grain. And so Joseph's gathering up what does it say there in verse 14? He ends up with all the money, all the money. <laughs> like people, the famine goes on for so long that all the money ends up being given to Joseph and Joseph brings it all into Pharaoh's house. So, wow. So there's a huge exchange of money. Okay, go on. So when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. Yes, so they ran, what are you going to do? So you think, well, I know what to do now with the famine. I can just go, at least they've, I know they've got grain down in Egypt, so I can go buy some. But what about when you run out of money? Then, uh, what are you going to do? Well, they go down to, to Joseph and they plead with them. It's just like they're asking for a, a handout or something. You know, just, just give us bread. We're going to die here. 
we have no money left. You have 100% of the wealth in these nations now, and, and, we're still, and we're still starving. So why should we die? And so Joseph makes them a proposal. What is that? And Joseph said, give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. Oh, okay. So not only does Joseph own all the money now, but, well, they still have livestock. I mean, it's how they live and everything, but, well, we've got, you know, so he says, well, how about you give me your livestock? So they say, okay, go on. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. That year. So this arrangement lasted for a whole year. So if you've got sort of the before period where they give all their money to him, and then you have a whole year where they're buying grain with their cattle. That's why, where I get the title, selling everything to Joseph, right? You already gave him all your money. Now you're in effect selling him all your cattle in order to get that uh, bread uh, to eat. Okay, and go on. What are they going to do next year? When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. <laughs> right. We, <laughs> my Lord, know, our money is gone. Go on. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. Wow. So let's hit pause there for a second. The money's gone and the cattle's gone. What are they going to do to stay alive? Joseph and Pharaoh already own all those things. What else can they possibly offer him? Look at this. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Wow. Wow. All we've got, we've got nothing. All we've got is ourselves, you know, our bodies and the land that we live. That's what else do we have? You know, they're being reduced and reduced and reduced to this terrible situation. And uh, go on. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Yes, the people and the land would die. You know, like, why have that happen? And so they make a proposal. Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Now, to my ear, I hear two requests in there. Buy us on our land for bread. Now, what they've been asking for the previous years was bread. They, they, they wanted the food. But it's interesting that they are now asking not only for bread, but for what else? For seed, right? Give us bread and give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land be not desolate. Now, isn't there that old saying about give someone a fish and you feed them for a day and teach them to fish and they can eat for a lifetime? Uh, giving someone bread is different than giving them seed, isn't it? Like you give them bread and they eat it and they stay alive, but then they're needy again the next day. So what they're asking for now is don't just give us bread, but give us the means of being able to go into farming again. You know, give, give us something where we can plant the seed. Now, it's a rather strange request in the midst of a raging seven-year famine. <laughs> like, uh, whew, where are you going to get the rain? How are you going to grow the, you know, so we got seed, but, you know, no rainfall or anything. How, how's that going to work? And yet that's their request by us and our land, not just the land. And it's amazing that both times they mention it, it's themselves first and then the land, our bodies and our land, by us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be the servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. So what did Joseph do? Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. Yes, listen to that simple summary there. You're not joking. Pharaoh now has all the money, all the cattle, owns all the land and all the people. 
it's a pretty extreme situation, and yet people have been driven to this by this terrible, terrible famine. Uh, go on. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Hmm. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their lands. Oh, I see. So you're saying that the priests were comfortable, they were okay because they had a portion, Pharaoh was already dealing out a portion to them. So they didn't, the priests didn't have to go through the same deal of sell the cattle, sell the land, become slaves and all that stuff. Uh, they already had a, 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 you know, some sort of a covenant with Pharaoh uh, so that they would get their food from him. So they didn't need to sell their land. They could still own it. But everybody else uh, was in a different boat. Go on. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. Yes, they asked for seed. <laughs> He's going to give them seed. And it says, sow the land. Now, Joseph is amazing for always sort of taking the long view. Like uh, when Pharaoh has his dream, Joseph is talking about, uh, okay, there'll be seven years of plenty, then there'll be seven years of famine, and here's what to do and everything. So still, here we are in the middle of the famine, and he's taking the long view. So what's going to happen next? What does he say? And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and for your food, for those of your households and as food for your little ones. Okay, now wait a minute. So... What, what did you say at the beginning there? You mean to say there's going to be a harvest? Yeah. At some point, there's going to be a harvest, and you're already wheeling and dealing about the harvest. <laughs> you, you, you already own the land, all the money, and all the people, and now there's bargaining going on about the harvest that hasn't even happened, and how would anybody think there's ever going to be a, a harvest? But what's the deal? 20%, right? Give a fifth to Pharaoh, and you keep the other four-fifths, that'll provide you seed for your own field. You won't have to come back to me. That's for seal. You can, you can use the seed that's, that's produced by the crops and plant that yourself, and you can use all that for food and for those who live in your household and your little ones. And what did they say? So they said, you have saved our lives. Wow, there it is. You've say, you know, that was the whole deal, right? It's all about saving their lives. You've saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth, except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. Yes, so there's this area where the priests lived, and that did not have to pay this 20%. But every other place in the, in the land... Uh, would owe, whenever there was a harvest, they would owe 20%. Uh, so in some ways, I don't know if you, I hope you're not as negative as I am, dear friends. There's something in me, I think it's from watching It's a Wonderful Life, where you have that character of Potter who's buying up everything, you know, and offering them, what is it, 20 cents on the dollar or something like that. And um, so that's an awful character of someone who would take advantage of people and p people are falling on hard times, there's a depression or whatever it is, and, and he's gonna buy up everything in town, and, and then he's sort of exploitative of the people and, and all that kind of thing. I, I don't think Joseph is quite being that way here, is he? Surely Joseph has a more positive meaning than that. It's an unbelievably successful program, and what's amazing is that Joseph did not initiate it. What, what did Joseph do to be so successful? He foresaw what was going to happen, and he stored up grain, period. That's all. He had the stuff. Then people who don't have the stuff, they need to get it from him, and so he's able to trade that for money, and then when that runs out, trade it for the cattle, all the livestock, those horses and all the animals and everything, and then he's able to trade it for the people themselves and their land and ends up having, giving Pharaoh this uh, 
20% right to all the lands except for the, the priest land uh, because they have this special arrangement with, with Pharaoh. So it's an amazingly successful deal. And it seems to me that he doesn't say, I don't see him as being exactly aggressive with people, is he? Joseph, <coughs> Joseph doesn't go out and say, you'll see next year, you'll become crawling on your knees to me and begging for, you know, whatever. He, he just, okay, I have something you need. Okay, who is the one who says, uh, uh, now he proposes when they say to him, we've run out of money, what are we gonna do? He says, well, how about the cattle? So he proposes that, but most of the time, the other people are the initiators. They come to him, they say we want, you know, and they pay the money, so it's their own free choice to do it. He didn't badger them into it or force them or manipulate them or whatever. They opted in to say, we'll give you our money. He said, well, how about the livestock? which was nice, you know, in a way of like, okay, I'll work with you here. Uh, you give me your livestock and I'll feed you for a whole year, the entire country, you know, I'll do that in exchange for your livestock. And then when the year is over, he doesn't say, okay, ha ha ha, now you're my slaves. They come to him and say, why should we die? You know, buy us and our lands. It's their idea. And how do they feel? Do, do they resent him? Do they hate him the way people hate Potter in that show? No, they say, you've saved our lives. You know, that's how they feel. You saved our lives. Uh, thank you. We wouldn't have made it through this famine if you hadn't stored up all that grain. And so it's fair and square. I got to tell you too, friends, although 20% seems, wow, it's like a double tithe or something. So, whoa, 20% in perpetuity, you know, there's a pretty big, you know, thing that you need to hand over. Uh, but on the other hand, Pharaoh legitimately owns the land and owns you. And it's actually a pretty good deal. I mean, there are artists in this world, are there not, who go to galleries and the gallery takes 60% and the artist gets 40. Aren't there situations with publishers where the publisher gets 88% and the author gets 12, if you're lucky, right? This is you, get 80%. It's not a bad deal in terms of that type of situation where you're owned outright and your land and yet you get to keep 80% and you get to sow your fields and have your families and feed, feed people and go on and you made it through the, through the famine. So there's a couple of different ways of looking at it, but what do we think this means on a spiritual level? What is this about? Joseph is such a positive character in scripture I always think that he means the Lord. I mean, who else uh, goes into prison and just kind of smiles and takes over the prison? <laughs> you know, he doesn't seem to have resentment or, or whatever. I know that some people say, well, he horses around with his brothers when they, when they come down. He won't reveal who he is, and they sort of go through various forms of terror. But it doesn't seem like he's being nasty. He just really wants to connect with Benjamin. Um, uh, but uh, what, what Swedenborg says that this means is that Joseph is a picture of the Lord. And the famine is a situation, what is famine? It's where there's no rain and there's no food kind of thing, right? And so rain has to do with truth and the food has to do with good or love, or joy, things like that. And so the famine, it's a severe famine where the people just have nothing. And over the years of this famine, they're reduced to this situation where they give up all their money, then they give up all their livestock, and then they give up themselves and, the, and their land. It, it gets so extreme. But it's interesting too that they ask for seed, not just bread. And they're the ones who bring up the seed. Give me seed. It just seems like a forward-looking thing, isn't it? Give me seed because we want to start again. We, we want to grow things. And then Joseph on behalf of Pharaoh says, fine, as long as we get what, got 20%, it's a, it's a great situation for everybody, I think. And they agree. They say, you've saved our lives. And so they made it a law in perpetuity. Um, so what I think is going on in here, and Scripture is always more mysterious uh, than we can fully fathom, but the famine is having this, is the state of deprivation of truth 
and love. And uh, Swedenborg talks about what the Bible calls temptations, uh, translated in various different ways, trials, crises of the spirit, and so forth. It's not just being tempted to eat another Twinkie or something. It, it's, uh, it's actually a really challenging, a crisis, crisis of the spirit, I think is a good way to put it. Um, and during those states, times of trial, evil spirits are able to inflame our lower selves. This is all for our own good. It feels horrible, but they're able to inflame our lower selves and they can block off the influence of heaven. This is what this famine is, where it doesn't rain. It can stop, stop the rain. Evil spirits have the ability in certain states that we go through to stop any spiritual rain from falling on us. And so we're, we're not getting rain. We're not getting food, you know, bread from heaven or, or whatever. We're, we're not getting the truth. We're not getting the love. We feel cut off from all that. And it feels horrible when you go through something like that, doesn't it, friends? Um, there's a beautiful teaching that Swedenborg says in this regard that if we ever in our lives experience something of truth or something of genuine love, the Lord stores that up inside ourselves somewhere where we can never get at it. So we may feel, I've run out of truth. I'm starving. I can't, you know, I'm dying here. But the fact is, no, the Lord's just put it somewhere that you can't get at it. Joseph has stored it up. It's still there. It's somewhere. But Joseph has, has control of that. You don't have access to it right now. Uh, when in the, before the famine, we may feel like, you know, how do you feel before the famine? You feel like, well, I have my fields. I sow the seed. The crops come up. I feed people, I make bread, I'm the source of good things for other people. But then you go through the famine, it's like, oh, I'm not that person. I don't create bread for others. I can hardly even feed myself. We're all, we're all dying here. I, 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 I actually don't have that power. And so you go to the Lord, in other words, you attribute to the Lord that the Lord is actually the source. So you go to the Lord and you say, please give me some bread, give me, give me some joy or something. And so the, the first time you go, uh, first it's money. And I think in the way Swedenborg handles this, it might be true in the, in the Hebrew, I'm not sure. It's, it's silver. It means truth anyway. The, the, the money is about truth. And I think at that first stage where you give all your money, is coming to the realization that all of your true thoughts actually come from the Lord. When you go through a state of famine, you realize, oh, I've got nothing. And um, I want to tell you, friends, uh, that um, uh, I've experienced so many times, uh, don't know if you experience this, I think it's true in any kind of creative endeavor or any kind of different circumstance where if I'm getting ready to give a talk or something like that, I virtually always, I go in, I'm excited, it's fun, I study stuff, and then there's some point at which I realize, man, I have got nothing. You know, I just go through that I've got nothing phase every time. I gave a talk to a young ministerial students at some point about this, and they said, is there any way to skip that part <laughs> where you feel like you've got nothing? And I said, if you find a way, call me up. I, it seems like a natural part of the thing that you realize I've got nothing. And then what often happens on the other side of that is just a few little ideas come in and all of a sudden you realize you've got more than you can deal with. And I think there's something about that in this story, going through the famine and then realize, oh no, the Lord is the so source of these thoughts. I can have thoughts. There's sometimes before Bible study where I'm thinking I've got a little tape recorder, digital recorder that I carry around with me and I try to record ideas for Bible study. And there's times where I know Bible study is coming and I think, okay, what ideas do I have for Bible study? I can, I can record for two hours and I know I got nothing. I have nothing to say to anyone. There's nothing, you know? 
It's just astonishing. I've gotten to a little better over the years at not panicking when that happens because it seems to land every time somehow by the grace of God. Uh, but, and I think that exercise is useful. It's actually useful to just keep recording. I don't know any other way to siphon it in than to just go through the experience of realizing, wow, I have no crops, <laughs> you know? I can't feed anybody. And, and, then, and then you go to Joseph and Joseph gives you, gives you what you need, you know? So that happens on an intellectual level, which I think is the money, realizing, oh, wait a minute, all this spiritual wealth is the Lord's. It, it, you know, I'll attribute it all to the Lord. That giving it to the Lord, I think, is attributing it to the Lord. So what's the next thing? When you run out of money, you go back, and Joseph says, well, how about your livestock? Well, I think the money had to do with the side of the intellect or truth. I think the livestock has to do with the side of the heart, uh, that you give all of that over the, as the famine keeps going, you realize, wow, not only the ideas in my head, but even um, the passions, the drive that I feel or, or whatever it might be, that comes from, that doesn't come from me because you can feel such a state, can we not sometimes, friends, of deadness in you that you realize, wow, I guess that's not me. You know, I thought I had this big passion for whatever, but beep, you know, I'm flatlining right now. <laughs> I got nothing. And, and uh, really that life comes from the Lord. I think that's that second phase of giving your livestock to the Lord, just a, attributing livestock generally in the correspondences means uh, positive emotions, good, good feelings, and things like joy and things like passions for whatever, you know, helping others and, and those sorts of things, you know, where, where sometimes you feel like, oh, I just, I've just run out of gas on those things or something, you know. You're in that long, long famine and so you attribute all that to the Lord. And that gets you through another spiritual year kind of thing. <laughs> okay, first of all, all the money, then all the cattle. Now, what are the bodies? Our bodies and our land, what is that? I've thought about that a lot, and, uh, and I've read what Swedenborg has to say about it, because he writes about this story. And I think what it means is, what, what is your body? like? With money and with your livestock, those are things that you own. But your body and your land is the most basic, Swedenborg says they're receptacles, they're like vessels. It's not only that your truth comes from the Lord and not only that any love you have in your heart comes from the Lord and any positive, you know, sort of passions or drives or whatever, but it's even that you have the capacity to think or that you have the capacity to feel love at all. I think that's the bodies and our land. You realize, wow, even, even the body, in a way it can even come down, you know, even your physical body is like, where did you get it? Well, the Lord gave it to you, right? It's a, you, you know, your body belongs to the Lord and, and, the, and the land, it comes down to a really basic level of just actually being human having a mind at all, which we don't all have 24 seven, but you know, having that capacity for mental stuff to go on, having that, that the fact of a heart that can sometimes feel things. I think when the famine really gets hard, the final stage is you say, you give all that to Joseph too. You know, the wow, it's not just that the truth I have doesn't come from me, and it's not just that the love doesn't come from me. I didn't even create myself. I don't even have that capacity. That's something that the Lord gave me. I think, how am I doing? You know, I think that's what the body is and the land and, and, and uh, has some, some meaning to do with that. And so you start out thinking, I'm a good person. I can feed people. I've got something that people need. <laughs> and then you find out through the family, oh, I've got nothing. <laughs> you know? I, I've got nothing. I have no thoughts. I have no feelings. I don't even have the capacity. All that comes from the Lord. And so you sell everything to Joseph. You attribute everything to the Lord. This whole thing comes from the Lord. And look at what the Lord is doing. He's, he's not interfering. He's just standing there. 
But if you go and you say, help me, I've, I, I have no, no thoughts or something like that. Sure, I'll sell you some. Like it's by our freedom, isn't it? He's not pushing it. He's not saying, hey, come on, you got to just, hey, why don't you just become my slave? You know, let's cut out all this. We don't have to wait for years. Why don't we just get on with it? You know? No, he's just hanging back. It's our idea. We finally say, hey, I'm, I'm done, you know, trying to be a human being or something, you know, like uh, I've just got to give myself entirely to you. That's, that's the only way this thing is going to work. And so it says in there that all the land becomes Pharaoh's, right? The whole thing uh, gets given to, to Pharaoh. So what is that 20%? I think the 20% is the recognition. So you go through this difficult, it's a very difficult time where you go from being productive to not being productive and being kind of helpless and being blocked or whatever you'd call it. Then when you get back to productivity again, you recognize that that comes from the Lord. That's what I think the 20% is. Oh, this is, this is the Lord's. I'm not operating under the same deal as I did before. I used to be, think I was my own person. I did, you know, had my own product, had my own thoughts, and my own feelings, stuff like that. Now I realize, hey, great things are happening. We got through the famine. The rain is falling, the crops are growing, everything's good, we've got the kids and we, we can feed them and everything like that. But I have to admit, this did not come from myself. This, this came from the Lord. That's how the Lord sort of buys up, buys up all the land. And you get to the point where you realize the Lord is um, your everything. Uh, let's look at a couple of other scriptures uh, just for fun, let's go to the right and go through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. There's something that Swedenborg says about this passage that has really struck me. He says, the Lord wills that we undergo a total submission and not that we be partly our own and partly the Lord's. That, that's his will. He can settle for no. He can accept no as an answer. You know, it does it all the time. But uh, his will is that we give ourselves lock, stock, and barrel, kitchen sink, all in. You know, that, that's what he's hoping for. Look at Deuteronomy 30. Let's start at verse 7 there and read through verse 10. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and, all, and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the pro produce of your good... Sorry and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. All your heart and with all your soul. That's. You know, isn't it interesting that it has the same kind of imagery of the fruit and the livestock and the land and everything in this passage? And that if you turn to the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord will give you all these things. And you'll realize all these things come from the Lord. Uh, that's the thing. The ego doesn't want to make that admission. And that's why the Lord allows us to go through difficult things. Because our ego in and of itself doesn't want to admit defeat, doesn't want to say, oh, I can't do it on my own. You know, I can't tough it out myself or something. Uh, but that's why the Lord he doesn't will the famine, but he allows it because we can come, if we're willing, to a situation in which we say, oh, it's, it's, all, it's all the Lord. And that's a great situation because the Lord can, can uh, bless us. The more and more we give ourselves to the Lord, the more we can be blessed. 
Let's go to the right and go through First and Second Samuel to Second Kings. Second Kings chapter 23. This is just a brief mention about this wonderful King Josiah who really, really followed the Lord. And in Second Kings 23:25, 25, it makes this statement about Josiah. 25. Now before him, am I in the right place? I think so. There was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. Can you sort of see that maybe the heart is like the livestock and the soul is like the money and the, you know, something like that. You, you, it's got the same feeling of like this. All these things are attributed. You turn to the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and so on. Um, oh, let's look in the Psalms in the middle of the Bible here. I want to go to Psalm 51. Mm. And uh, let's read this, uh, yeah, let's read from 14 through the end of that Psalm 51. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That's a really beautiful sentiment, isn't it? That's, can you see how that relates that the, the, the Lord actually likes that state, not because of the pain that we go through, but because if that's the time when we give ourselves to the Lord, then those sacrifices of God, that broken spirit and the broken and the contrite heart, because the Lord takes pity on us. Joseph, another thing Joseph doesn't do is to say, hey, we got no grain for you, fend for yourself. Go to somebody else, talk to the Assyrians or something. You know, he, he always, no, sure, we'll, we'll take care of you and everything. Uh, go on, let's just read these last two there. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Yes, the, um, I think that whole system of sacrifices in the Old Testament is about this same thing. It's about selling everything to Joseph, you know, attributing everything to the Lord. I think it's what those, those sacrifices are about. Uh, let's look at, okay, let's go through, let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. Hmm. 12, uh, let's do 10 to 18, shall we? Let's try, try that. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. Oh, and here it is. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Isn't that what we're talking about in the famine? Who feels good at the end? You know, who's exalted at the end of this process? Uh, everybody else is, is humbled their land and so on, but only the Lord is exalted in that day. Go on. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low, mm. upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower and upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all the beautiful sloops, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. 
the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Yes, let's stop there. That, that's just great, isn't it? I think that's what we're talking about, where the, the Lord's stock goes up and our stock goes down kind of thing that you, okay, you transfer that thing to the Lord. Oh, what is good here? Oh, it's the Lord that's good. It's not, it's not me. Uh, let's turn to the right and go through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then we hit Hosea and then quickly Joel. I want to go to Joel chapter 2. We read some beautiful things from Joel 2 last week. This is just shortly before that passage. Um, look at 12 to 17. Well, we, we might just read 12 and 13. Let's have a look. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. You think that's related? It seems like it's the same kind of story of like, yes, turn, turn to the Lord. Fasting, you know, famine, right? And what does it say there? It's wonderful. So rend your heart and not your garments. You know, they would have this habit when they were in grief, they would just tear their clothes back then. And, uh, but it says, rend your heart not your garments. Go on. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Yes, indeed. Okay, let's stop there. Let's go into the New Testament. Uh, I want to go through the four Gospels and keep going to the right till you hit Acts. And let's go to Acts chapter 5. Very striking, perhaps disturbing story, but I think it fits in well here. Let's start, start at 5 verse 1. You get to say some proper nouns here. Oh, good. <coughs> but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Oh, they sold a possession. Okay. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain widow's, oops, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Aha. Uh -huh. So you see what went on? The idea then was that everybody had communal property. So he sold his property and he gave some of the proceeds, but not all. He, he, he kept some of it back, right? And, and, he, okay. and here you go and laid it at the apostles' feet. The Lord wants a complete and total submission, and not that we should be partly our own and partly the Lord's. Okay, go on. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Uh-huh. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold... Was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Hmm. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. Hmm. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out and buried him. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Oh, it's harsh, huh? Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. Mm. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Yes, now that might strike you as a little harsh. Um, <laughs> these, these people, <laughs> a little bit, uh, that they fall down to breathe their last... And uh, Peter somehow knows that they've held back this, you know, he has some uh, insight from the spiritual world that they've held back this, this uh, money and said, you've not only lied to other people, but to God. Uh, why did you hold that back? Uh, what are you doing? And then they kind of entrap the wife as well, where they, she doesn't know what's happened. 
And she comes in and he said, how much did you sell it for? And she doesn't come clean either. They had a little sort of conspiracy going and everything. And so uh, when he hears that she's lied as well, she says, why, are you, why did you agree together to test the spirit of the Lord? And listen to the people who just buried your husband. And oh, she's, she breathes her last too, and they go and bury her. I think what that story, as sort of chilling as it is, is about is this same thing of like the Lord wants us to be all in and not sort of make a kind of a partial, partial little, you know, what, what did it say about the widow's might that other people put in a little bit of what they own, but she put in everything. And um, the Lord loves that all in kind of attitude. Uh, that's what he wants, a complete and total submission and not that you be partly your own and partly the Lord's. Because spiritually, that can kind of kill you to be sort of, well, I gave the Lord a little bit of credit, you know, or something. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't work that way. The, the Lord wants the whole thing. Uh, let's turn to the right and go through Acts and Romans. want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 comes up after the Romans there. Let's pick up at verse 12, shall we? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Yes, it's nice clarity, isn't it? And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Listen to this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And members has that old meaning of limbs, like you are Christ's limbs. Don't you know that your bodies are Christ's limbs? Go on. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Yes, and it goes on in that spirit. I just mainly wanted to hear like the idea of giving your body you know what I mean? So the, the body and the land and so everything to the Lord. I think that's part of that same acknowledgement that we're talking about tonight, that you realize, wow, even the fact that I have this flesh, that I have this mind, that I have this spirit and so on, all this is uh, owing to the Lord. And we should recognize you act a little different. You know, when Pharaoh owns your land, it's a little different than when you own it, I think. You know, the feeling that you have about, hey, I own this, as opposed to, oops, you know, uh, I owe Pharaoh some of this because Pharaoh actually owns this and actually owns me and has kindly allowed me to, to stay here and work the land. I get to keep 80%, but, but uh, I don't belong to myself anymore. And uh, let's go back to Revelation. These are rather negative back here, but um, we started in Genesis. You just got to go back to Revelation. And uh, Revelation chapter 9. These are about people who didn't take the bait. <laughs> Nine verses 20 and 21 here. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Mm. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Yes, and the reason I bring that up tonight is that it, the book of Revelation shows me in a couple of places that the whole purpose of that suffering is to bring us to repentance, you know, to get to that point uh, uh, where we turn to the Lord with everything we've got here. You know, I want to have this relationship with you and not just be on my own here. But unfortunately, these people didn't, didn't take the bait. They, they didn't repent of the works of their hands, even though things had gotten difficult. Look, you have the same message in 16, uh, verses 9 to 11 there. 
Well, let's start with 8, 16, verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. So that's not going to be fun. You're going to go through a difficult thing. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. See, the purpose of that angel pouring that out sounds so harsh, but the purpose of it was for people to repent and give the Lord the glory, but they weren't willing to do it. Okay, next two verses. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Yeah, that's right. Again, the whole purpose of it was to bring people to a point of repentance so that it's not that the Lord wills for us to go through difficult things like famine or these other things that are described here, but that the Lord is standing there ready to take us in when we come through those experiences. He has all that grain. Uh, part of what uh, Swedenborg says about this is that Joseph holds, so you've been through, you've got some truth, you've got some good experiences you've been through. Now you're going through a famine and you're not feeling those things at all. But the Lord still has those things somewhere. You just have to go to the Lord to get it. He has stored all that up. And he says, oh, no, this is mine. You have to buy this from me, you know. And then he gl gladly gives it to us and, and doles out those things. But then we understand, oh, I see. I have to go to the Lord to get those good things. I don't just get it for myself. Similar to the, the uh, manna that fell in the wilderness. Uh, the, oh, that comes from the Lord. That, that's just a blessing. We don't generate that for ourselves. Um, so, uh, and when you're able, when you become able through this process again to give to people, to do things for people, it's such a blessing to realize because that's the situation that the angels are in, where they recognize that all their ability to be helpful to others comes from the Lord, and they attribute that fifth, you know. Oh, this is, this is the Lord. The, the, the Lord lets me have 80%, but really I don't deserve any of it. it it's, all, it's all the Lord's. It's really entirely the Lord's. So in conclusion, spiritual famine, difficult experiences that we go through and so on, eventually drives us to attribute to the Lord all of our truth and love and even our capacity to receive these qualities. Thank you, good friends, for your kind attention. Let's close with a prayer. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the one God of heaven and earth. We thank you, Lord, for your patience with us, carrying us through the times that we're going through famine, difficulty, deprivation, difficult feelings, loss of joy, and so on. Please help us to find our way to you, Lord, and gradually lead us through that process. First of all, we give you the wealth of our understanding. We realize that comes from you. Then we realize that you are actually the source of our good feelings. We give our heart to you. And finally, we give to you even the fact that we exist that we have minds and hearts at all. And when we come into that state, then the famine can end and we can be more productive for others and more humble and grateful than ever. Our Father who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting, friends. We'll have a harvest someday. <laughs>